and we have none other than Professor Sanyal who is going to take us forward to current developments in treatment of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Professor Sanyal, please. Thank you. Um, um, good morning, uh, or I yeah. guess evening, evening in, yeah. In, yeah. in Myanmar. Yes, in evening. It is definitely evening. Uh, so here are my conflicts. Okay. I think we've already heard that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease often occurs in the setting of uh, systemic obesity and metabolic syndrome. Uh, Amit, what are you doing? Can someone stop moving my slides around? Okay, thank you. Um, so it is really important to think about what is happening with our patient. Our patients are at immediate risk, not only from their liver disease, but from a variety of other ailments that involve the heart, their arteries, the pancreas, and the kidneys. And the common element across all these comorbidities, which are commonly present in our patient, uh, is the presence of metabolic stress that is related to systemic inflammation and fibrosis. And so there is common biology that connects all of these different end organ diseases that frequently occur at the same time. Now, the issue with competing risks is that treating one condition without paying attention to the others means they will simply be killed by another disease and not the disease you're treating. So if we really want to improve the long-term outcomes for our patients, we need to improve the outcomes for all of the competing threats to life. And to do that efficiently, we need to get to the root cause, which is the metabolic stress that these patients are under. And this is linked to diet-induced obesity. So weight loss is the most common therapy, as shown in this cartoon, that has been shown to benefit each and every one of these end organs. When we look at the liver disease, there's also literature that weight loss is beneficial. But there are some myths associated with weight loss that is worth talking about. First of all, we claim that weight loss will improve the NASH, and frequently you will hear people say that a patient has to be tried on simple weight loss measures for six to 12 months before drugs are provided. Well, let's test that hypothesis. If you look on the left over here, you will look at the number of people who did not resolve their steatohepatitis. And you can see over here that a large number of these patients had weight loss. In fact, you hear that you need 5% weight loss to get resolution of steatohepatitis. If you draw a line right here at five, you will see that a large number of people lost more than 5% of their body weight but did not resolve their steatohepatitis. Conversely, if you look at those who resolved their steatohepatitis, you will see that a lot of these patients actually over here, the majority of these patients did lose weight. So weight loss is beneficial but does not guarantee that you will resolve your steatohepatitis. We also say that you need 10% weight loss to improve fibrosis. If you draw a line at 10% over here, and you look at the number of people whose fibrosis improved, I don't know what's that, okay. Look at the number of people whose fibrosis improved. You will see that the majority of people whose fibrosis regresses over time actually did not lose more than 10% weight. So the issue is far more complex, and therefore we need pharmaceutical development to continue to help our patients who have this disease because the improvement in liver histology is not a simple function of the degree of weight loss. Now, moving on, 
We also know that from bariatric surgery, that the disease activity improves, but advanced fibrosis, particularly this is the population that is at risk of liver-related outcomes, frequently does not improve so much. So if you look at over here, whether you had steatohepatitis or you not, you can see that after bariatric surgery, steatohepatitis resolves in a lot of people. But if you look at the people who had persistent uh, severe fibrosis, about half the people, 46%, continued to have severe fibrosis. And so this again tells us that weight loss is not the only solution and cannot be used as an excuse to prevent drug therapy for our patients. Furthermore, if you lose a lot of weight, it leads to some unexpected consequences. So this is data from the US combining, now you can see many different studies. And what they uniformly show to different degrees is that the suicide risk is increased after bariatric surgery. And the reason for this is that many patients eat excessively to cope with stress and depression. And when you remove their coping mechanism without offering an alternate coping mechanism, then it aggravates the underlying depression. So there are other things that you have to think about when making recommendations about weight loss. So for all of these reasons, we need to continue to look for pharmacological means in addition to our lifestyle changes that we are, uh, should recommend to all of our patients. Now, there are new drugs being developed for weight loss. And the one that is particularly interesting because it seems very non-toxic is the Gelesis 100. This has already been approved in the US for obesity and should be on the market later this year. And the basic concept is very simple. There are these simple granules which when you take by mouth, when they go into the stomach, in contact with gastric acid, they swell up and essentially occupy the lumen of the stomach, so thereby triggering the satiety signals from the stomach so that you stop eating and you end up eating less. So you just take a capsule right before your meal and you'll end up eating less. And the data show that over here, as you can see, if you look at proportion of people losing more than 5%, 7%, or 10% weight, those who were on the Gelesis compound, almost a third of these patients lost more than 10% weight. And more, uh, over 60%, about 60% of these patients lost more than 5% weight. And you can see over here, this is just shown as adjusted risk reduction on the right-hand side. So this is potentially a compound that could help with weight loss, but also in the process of improving weight, impact all of the end organs that our patients have uh, affected. The second procedure that is very interesting is the concept of duodenal mucosal resection, so resurfacing. And this involves putting a needle through a scope into the plane between the mucosa and the sub submucosa, lifting that plane with a hot saline and creating a thermal burn circumferentially for about 10 centimeters, and then allowing normal mucosa to uh, reform. What that does is that it reduces the kind of cells that are in the proximal gut and reduces the hormonal response to food. And it has been shown in a phase two trial that 60% of patients who underwent this uh, had defatting of the liver. And a pivotal trial is now being developed. These data are now shown over here where you can see that approximately you have 5.4% absolute fat change and a relative change of 32% median. Going on to dr other drugs that are more liver related, there's a lot of activity which targets the four phases of pathogenesis from metabolic overload, cell stress, inflammation, and fibrosis. So let's review these quickly to see where we stand. Here is a profile of some of the drugs that are leading the way, including FGF and the FXR axis, the FGF21 axis, thyroxine beta receptor, and the GLP-1s. And the goals, if the goal is to improve all of the end organs, it's important to look at 
what these drugs also do to the lipid profile. And you will notice that several of these actually increase LDL cholesterol, and that has to be taken into consideration, and we don't have the MACE data. So it is very important when we evaluate the liver benefits of many of these classes of compounds that we also look at the effect of these compounds on the heart and on the kidneys. So with that background, let's look at uh, the liver-related outcomes in these patients. Starting first with phase three trials, which are furthest along and for which we have the largest amount of data, the regenerate uh, results are out. And so let's look at this real quickly. So before we go into phase three, it is important to understand that as you get to bridging fibrosis, your mortality risk increases. Your background mortality risk before stage three is relatively low. And then the highest mortality is in cirrhosis. This is linked to liver-related outcomes, as shown on the left, whereas by fibrosis stage, actually coronary artery disease outcomes are constant. Part of it is because of the attention we pay to the heart and manage the cardiovascular disease very aggressively in this population. Cerebrovascular disease also rises with increasing fibrosis. Again, there is a collinearity between the risk of outcomes across multiple organs as you progress. So the natural course of the disease can be divided into thinking like a metro station into these stops. So one stop is what we call clinically significant fibrosis, which is NASH with fibrosis stage two or three, which then can progress to cirrhosis and then to outcomes. Cardiovascular outcomes can occur throughout the course of this, while liver outcomes occurs over here. So the goal is to take people at this station and stop them from going to the next station or preventing progression to cirrhosis. So the REGENERATE trial looked at 10 and 25 milligrams of obeticolic acid and FXR agonist and looked at fibrosis improvement by one stage or more without worsening of NASH or NASH resolution without worsening of fibrosis as their primary endpoint. And you can see over here, there's a small but statistically significant differential in terms of the proportion of people who had more than one stage fibrosis improvement. And on the other hand, if you look at percentage of people who had resolution of NASH, this did not reach significance in the primary ITT population shown on the left. Now, when you include people with stage one disease also, not just stage two and three, then these things become significant. And this may be partly because of the uh, greater plasticity of the disease earlier in the course of the disease. Now, when you look at the overall pathologist assessment, there are two ways you assess NASH resolution, either by uh, demonstration of ballooning to be zero and inflammation to be zero or one, or by an overall assessment by the pathologist. So when you look at the overall pathologist assessment, it was significantly improved as well. And mind you, this is blinded assessment. We also know that once you get past the 18-month time point at which these histology were obtained, non-invasive measures show that liver stiffness continues to improve over time. All of these together suggest that the drug indeed does improve the liver status, both in terms of injury and inflammation. There is currently a lot of debate on the benefit and risk analysis. We already talked about these benefits, but on the right-hand side, there are rare cases of hepatotoxicity. In Regenerate, there's also a small but significant signal for gallbladder-related uh, complications like acute cholecystitis, and then it causes the LDL cholesterol to go up, and there's also pruritus. Now, the pruritus can be managed in most patients, and the dyslipidemia can also be controlled with statins. But these are give you pause for concern. So we need more real outcomes data to see whether these biochemical changes actually translate into increased risk for outcomes. Also, it probably makes sense if you're going to use obeticolic acid to get an ultrasound first and be very cautious, if at all, to use it in people with gallstones. That's my personal view. And uh, if you do not have gallstones after starting OCA, probably should get an ultrasound after two months to make sure you have not developed de novo gallstones. The lipoprotein story is very important because when you use obeticolic acid, 
you actually increase LDL cholesterol because cholesterol can be converted into bile acids and when you block it with obeda cholic acid, that cholesterol has nowhere to go. So it ends up in PLDL and eventually into LDL. But when you reduce the amount of triglyceride coming out of the liver, the LDL particles can, VLDL particles can be chewed up very easily. So you end up basically with larger VLDL particles, uh, larger LDL particles, which are less atherogenic. It is also important to place LDL cholesterol rise in clinical perspective. The relationship between changes in LDL cholesterol and clinical outcomes is shown on the left. This is a very important graph in my view for anyone who is treating NASH. On the left, you are looking at the, as the differential between two groups increases, uh, you can see the rise in event rate. On the other hand, if you decrease LDL cholesterol, the decrease in risk is shown on the right. And this is a linear relationship along a log scale. And so what that means is if you take LDL over here, the differential is about 0.4 millimoles, which is about 10 to 20 milligrams. So your risk of a cardiac event is about 6% uh, of a background risk of about 1%. So about 0.06% differential over a three-year time frame. So when you start thinking about risk, we really need to understand, instead of just jumping up and down about LDL cholesterol, we really need to know what we mean by how much of a risk the specific amount of LDL cholesterol actually imposes on our first individual patient. Other agents in phase three include elafibrinone, which the primary outcomes have been uh, put out by the company, did not meet its primary endpoint, and these other trials are currently ongoing. Moving on to phase two very quickly, very exciting data from India with a drug called saroglitazar, which has been shown to reduce liver fats, which is shown in orange over here. In, uh, and they're shown, showing the proportion of people with more than 10%, 20%, and 30% fat, along with improvement in ELF. Uh, phase two histology-based data should be coming later this year. There is also a study with, from Pfizer using a ACC inhibitor showing very remarkable defatting of the liver, almost 70%, but it is associated with hypertriglyceridemia but that can be managed with a fibrate. There's a lot of interest in SGLT2s, and these are data with SGLT1 and 2, which also affects both intestine and the kidneys, and showing decrease in body weight, decrease in ALT, GGT, more data coming. GLP-based therapeutics are very exciting because they improve cardiac outcomes, all-cause mortality, chronic kidney disease, cause weight loss, and now, semaglutide is coming on strong, and these are data showing uh, weight loss with semaglutide. These are data with combined GLP, GIP, and GLP, and there's also data with GLP-1 and glucagon agonists. Uh, the top-line data from semaglutide were just put out there and produces 60% resolution of hepatitis, but did not have a big effect on fibrosis, and time will tell whether the time course of improvement in steatohepatitis will translate into improved fibrosis or not. Lastly, combination therapeutics are coming. It is definitely the future, but it requires knowledge of the population. One size does not fit all. We have to match the mechanism of action to drivers of disease at different points in the course of the disease. The root cause has to be the anchor. So you have to have a metabolic target as an anchor for combination therapy. For early stage disease, you can use two metabolic targets, but for advanced stage disease, including a metabolic and antifibrotic regimen makes sense. Very important, should not just blindly follow the pack and should not try to treat everybody, regardless of stage and what is causing their disease uh, at a given stage, uh, to treat them with a single combination. So the paradigm for the future is going to be when you make the initial assessment, we start with weight loss regimen, lifestyle, and with or without drugs, use of statins and fibrates versus saroglitazar for managing atherogenic risk, use of SGLT2 and GLP-1 agonists as indicated if you have 
type 2 diabetes and have significant risk for cardiovascular and renal outcomes. After a period of initial therapy with these common drugs, you reassess residual active disease, and if they still have fibrosis stage 2 or higher and have active disease, then we want to consider treatment to reduce progression to cirrhosis and liver outcomes, and ultimately then reassess periodically to document that the health of the patient has actually been improved. At the end, all drugs being developed will need to show that you're reducing mortality, reducing healthcare costs, improving the functionality of the patient, and the quality of life. So I will stop there and uh, be happy to take questions. CFM, caring for well-being.